Good afternoon, everyone. ITEC India welcomes all the participants for today's regional distance learning seminar session. Today's topic is central nervous system, HIV and OI central nervous system. We are continuing this topic from March and the speaker is Dr. Jaya Ma'am. Dr. Jaya Chakravati Ma'am is a professor with the Department of General Medicine, Institute of Medical Sciences, Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi. She is also the program director for the Center of Excellence in HIV Care and nodal officer for ART Center at BHU Varanasi. She is a national trainer for HIV and has been involved in training and mentoring of the ART centers. She has more than 95 publications with around 4,900 citations in international and national journals. We welcome you, ma'am, for today's session and request you to start this session. Thank you, Shweta. Actually, this is a continuation of my previous uh, session on CNS where we did I think up to CMV retinitis. So we had talked about cryptococcal meningitis and how uh, screen of cryptococcal meningitis should be done. And it's very important, especially for the ART centers, which are from this part of the country, because consistently in BHU, we are getting in patients with CD4 less than 200, uh, the positivity of serum cryptococcal antigen is around 10 to 15%. But that's quite a high number. So all of you should be very, very vigilant and do the screening properly and um, uh, consistently. Second, we had talked about toxoplasmosis, where the definitive diagnosis, the patient usually comes at focal neurological deficit and maybe seizures. And when you uh, do an imaging, you get a MRI with a ring enhancing lesion. And what uh, the definitive diagnosis is, of course, by biopsy, which is very difficult to do. So many a times we just do a IgG serum toxoplasma. And if that IgG is positive, we give an empirical treatment for toxoplasmosis. And after six to eight weeks, we just do an imaging and see whether that it has improved or not. Okay, because biopsy is very difficult. Of course, you can get a definitive diagnosis by doing a biopsy. The third thing we talked about was cytomegalovirus disease. Uh, we should be very, very clear that cytomegalovirus disease, though retinitis is the commonest presentation, and of course, it's a life, uh, not a life threatening, it's a vision threatening uh, emergency. Uh, we should always look for uh, CMV retinitis in all patients who have a, a CD4 count less than 100, especially. Better to do it below 200, but less than 100 is your uh, cutoff for uh, uh, doing an ophthalmoscopy and ruling out CMV retinitis before you start ART. And you should never forget that CMV can disease, uh, cause disease any part of the uh, GIT, right? From esophageal ulcers to whole of GI ulcers and diarrhea and bloody diarrheas. And it can also affect, in fact, recently we had a patient whose uh, chronic biopsy was so much teeming with CMV that the actually pathologist called me up and said, Madam, I do not know. I've never seen so much CMV. I said, no, it's a, a retropositive patient, so don't worry. We see it. So the third uh, manifestation of cytomegalovirus disease is basically uh, in the CNS where you have typical aseptic meningitis or you can have something called um, uh, uh, sacroiliac uh, uh, um, uh, syndrome called like GB syndrome where there's lower limb weakness along with bladder involvement. And when you do a CSF PCR for CMV, that may be positive, okay? So now for today's. Uh, today we have all the blue ones left. I'll tell you one by one. So the next slide, please. So we'll start with meningitis. So next slide, yeah. So when you talk about meningitis in uh, HIA patient, there are four main type of meningitis, which is very common. Aseptic meningitis, which is usually viral, which is common in general population also. This aseptic meningitis uh, could be due to either HIV or other viruses like um, varicella zoster or herpes simplex, uh, um, CMV even, okay? And HIV per se can also cause uh, aseptic meningitis. The second is bacterial meningitis. Uh, well, in India, now the incidence of bacterial meningitis is decreasing. So we have, uh, in a tertiary care, in normal patients also, we get less of bacterial meningitis. We get it in only those who are predisposed. They have had some surgery, neurosurgery or something like that, or have a uh, ear discharge. So yes, but HIV patients are also vulnerable. So they can also get bacterial meningitis. What is most important to us is tuberculosis meningitis. 
you know in hiv tuberculosis is the main opportunistic one of the most common opportunistic infection and it can also uh, present as disseminated tuberculosis and tuberculosis meningitis is really really common and we should really think about it we should really try and diagnose it and treat it very well and of course, I've told you the importance of cryptocoal meningitis, and I took a lot of time to tell you about that because it is an uncommon meningitis. If you don't think about cryptococcal meningitis, you will not be able to diagnose it because the CSF is usually normal in cryptococcal meningitis, and you need to do a CSF cryptococcal antigen test or CSF India blueing staining, okay, or CSF culture. So next slide, please. So we start with aseptic meningitis. So, as I told you, both it can be caused both by HIV itself or it can be due to other viruses. Uh, um, the viruses I already named for you, it could be herpes simplex is common, uh, CMV, viral zoster, they can all cause aseptic meningitis. Certain immune processes like non-infectious inflammatory processes like iris also can present like aseptic meningitis. Okay. Now, the course, how does it present? We know all meningitis presents with either fever, more than fever, headache, um, um, nausea, vomiting, neck stiffness, photophobia. These are the common symptoms of meningitis and patients with HIV also present like that. Okay. Sometimes if it is a disseminated varicella zoster and having meningitis, you can also have a typical varicella zoster rashes or chicken pox like rashes. So how do you diagnose? We all know we have to do a CSF where the cell count is very, very um, uh, uh, raised. And uh, uh, sorry, I'm talking about aseptic meningitis where the cell count is not very raised and it is lymphocytic uh, predominant and uh, the proteins may be normal or my, very mildly elevated. So there will, some, there will be some pleocytosis that is some increase in cells, mainly lymphocytic because it's a, uh, usually a viral, of, a viral origin and almost normal to mildly elevated protein and my, a normal glucose concentration. We will compare all the four meningitis at the end. There's a slide, so that will help you. So most of the aseptic meningitis, you don't need to manage because there is no treatment except for herpes uh, simplex uh, meningitis where you can give acyclovir if you can diagnose by doing a proper PCR. Next slide. Next slide, please. So next we come to bacterial meningitis. The common cause of bacterial meningitis both for PLHIV and non-PLHIV uh, patients is the same. The most common organism is streptococcus pneumoniae followed by H. influenzae and Neisseria meningitis. Okay, now the symptoms are almost the same, the same thing like fever, but it is a very, very bacterial meningitis means the patient will have a very acute uh, uh, symptoms and very fulminant type of symptoms, and then fever, headache, stiffness, photophobia, nausea, vomiting, and the patient may become drowsy, and then later on may go into coma. And usually, it may or may not be preceded by a prodromal illness, like respiratory illness or a sore throat, okay? But you may have certain underlying uh, diseases, like uh, either a CNS surgery, or neurosurgery being done, or you may have ear discharges, chronic ear discharges. Those are predisposing factors. Now, how to diagnose? We all know how to diagnose bacterial meningitis. The CSF is very, very um, uh, specific. Like, uh, they have a very high cell count, mainly neutrophilic. The cell count may go from 100 to 10,000. You will not get 100 if the patient has not been on some antibiotic. Usually, if the patient come to us after they have taken some sort of antibiotics, uh, that is why the cell count uh, becomes uh, decreased. The proteins are raised and the sugar is characteristically very, very low. So, you can diagnose it by doing a gram stain and culture. And uh, uh, when you do a culture, you should also go for an antibiotic sensitivity because uh, the organism may be resistant because of the widespread use of self and another. Uh, third generation cephalosporin, which is the drug of choice for bacterial meningitis. Next, please. So, imaging can uh, should be done uh, before you put an LP inside a patient to rule out any focal uh, um, lesions in the uh, brain. So, how do you treat bacterial meningitis? It does not differ from 
um, uh, PLHIV uh, as compared to non-HIV patient, it is the same. We start with a third generation uh, cephalosporin, that is ceftriaxone. The dose is high. It is two gram twice daily. That is almost four gram of ceftriaxone. Uh, you can add vancomycin if you think your streptococcus pneumonia is maybe resistant to ceftriaxone because of the huge misuse of ceftriaxone in the uh, general population. Of course, you can also give penicillin, which, which is usually not uh, given in most places. And how long do you treat with uh, ceftriaxone? Usually it is 10 to 14 days. Next slide, please. The third most important type of meningitis is tubercular meningitis. And tuberculosis in the CNS can have many uh, manifestations. Of course, it can uh, present as meningitis, but it can also come as a tuberculoma or tubercular brain, brain abscess. And you will have uh, the four symptoms. And added to that, you will have a lot of headache. Nausea, vomiting is very common. Because tuberculosis can present as a um, uh, vasculitis. It can cause any focal neurological def uh, uh, defect. Because it causes a basal meningitis, it can cause a lot of cranial nerve palsy. Okay. And so the patient can have, uh, because it can also uh, present as tuberculoma along with meningitis, so the patient can also have seizures. So you can have a myriads of signs and symptoms. So depending upon how and um, um, the patient is presenting, usually basal meningitis is very, very uh, prominent feature of tuberculosis meningitis. So you get a lot of headache, nausea, vomiting, and you get a lot of cranial nerve palsy. And the sixth cranial nerve palsy is the most common form of palsy. And when there is vasculitis and infarct, the patient can present with hemiparesis, seven of the seven cranial nerve palsy, etc. Now, how do you diagnose uh, the CSF? Again, the pressure is high. The proteins are quite raised. Sugar may be low. And there is lymphocytic leucocytosis. Okay. So, but they have not written here. But for you, the main uh, uh, CVNAT is available everywhere nowadays. So, you should take that C, uh, CSF and send it for CSF CVNAT. That is, uh, that is how you get definitively diagnose tubercular meningitis. And once you have diagnosed, you start the standard ATT drugs. You don't need to give anything else. And along with the standard ATT, you can give steroids. Now, uh, steroid has to be given in tubercular meningitis. There are very few indications for giving steroids in HIV and tubercular meningitis is one of the definitive uh, indications along with PCP pneumonia. Okay, that you must have studied. And you can uh, uh, use measure, measures to reduce ICP. Uh, um, you can give glycerol and diamox and other things like that. Next slide. So this is how you differentiate uh, the different uh, CSF findings in the um, between the cryptococcal and tubercular meningitis and bacterial meningitis and syphilis. So. When you come to cryptococcal meningitis, I just want to reiterate the fact again that the CSF may be quite normal in cryptococcal meningitis. Okay. And cells are never that raised. Proteins may not be that elevated. Huh? But low sugar may be there. And low sugar is a bad prognostic sign for cryptococcal meningitis. And how do you diagnose? I've told you again and again. You have to do a India ink uh, staining in the CSF. That is, um, but better than that is to do a cryptococcal antigen test if it is possible. For those in the eastern part of the UP, I will definitely, uh, I will be actually I'm approach the UP sites to give us more kits and maybe I'll make it available at your center so that you can screen people with cryptococcal and uh, serum, uh, serum cryptococcal antigen. And if it is positive, if you have the facility, you should go for a CSF uh, cryptococcal antigen testing. But if you don't, then you can refer to a uh, nearby center, you can refer to us for all that language. So, what about tuberculosis? What what will be the number of cells in the um, uh, CSF? It will be in few hundreds. The counts will be around few few hundreds, two hundred to four hundred. There's nothing by uh, fixed key. Itna hi hoga, okay. But what is more important is that will be predominantly lymphocytic. Okay. Now, proteins are quite elevated uh, in. Uh, uh, tuberculosis, and sugar may be normal to low. 
okay then i told you how do you diagnose definitive diagnosis of course can be do uh, with culture or you can go for a cd nat which is much more easier and very very well available everywhere okay now if you talk about the bacterial meningitis where streptococcus pneumoniae is the most common organism of course the counts will be very raised thousands but at times i told you patient already has antibiotics and they'll come to you after taking antibiotics then the counts are lower here the proteins are also very high and sugar is very low okay so that is very characteristic okay sugar is very low in your uh, bacterial as well as it is very low when the cryptococcal burden is very high in the csf and that is a bad prognostic sign so how do you diagnose and definitely diagnose bacterial meningitis you should be doing a gram staining and a culture and that will reveal the organism what can be easily done and should not be missed is a syphilis uh, meningitis due syphilis in plhiv and everybody should do it because vdrl tests are available with us syphilitic meningitis also is lymphocytic predominant uh, you get a lot of lymphocytic predominant cells up to 400 cells and proteins are slightly raised sugar may be near normal and how do you clinch the diagnosis by doing the vdrl in the csf it is not the serum it is the csf vdrl okay this is this uh, table is very helpful for those um, you can uh, take it and keep it with you next slide please but remember lumbar puncture is done after ruling out faculty edema and if you don't have if you can't rule it out just do a very very cardiac csf and it is always prudent if you can do an imaging before doing a csf that is usually available a ct scan is usually available every day the next disease which we want to talk about is pm that is progressive multifocal lymphoencephalopathy next slide please Now, PML is a demyelinating disease caused by a viral virus, and which is a JC virus, and that is a human polyoma virus. That virus, what does it do? It uh, actually many of us may be uh, infected with JC virus, and when your CD4 count is low, then there is a reactivation of the virus in the body. You don't acquire it like you acquire a bacterial infection. Okay, so it is always there. It it reactivates. and it destroys your oligodendrocytes and so that is if your oligodendrocytes are destroyed your myelination process is damaged and that is why you have a demyelinating disease okay so it is a progressive pml is progressive it is multifocal means demyelination uh, is occurring at different places at the same time okay and um uh, incidence in hiv uh, patients around 3 to 5 uh, percent and it can occur in patients who are already on art also even with effective art and that is a problem because pm does not have any specific treatment and the only treatment we thought before is to give art and improve your immuno suppression but it can occur even if you are taking an effective art next slide please so as i said it is a progressive disease it is why is it progress, uh, progressive because we do not have a specific treatment it is multifocal demyelination whenever there is damage to oligodendrocytes there will be a multifocal um, damage all over the place so there will be focal neurological de deficits which are usually incidence and onset and steadily progressing okay and it involves a different parts of the brain spinal cord involvement is there Okay, and now optic nerves are not involved. Like in why do why why are we saying this? Because we are, whenever you think about demyelinating diseases in adults, you think about multiple sclerosis, where optic nerves are very commonly involved. Okay, so because it is a prog slowly progressive disease and multifocal disease, you can may, yeah, the patient may come with focal neurological deficit, and um, uh, and the clinical progression may be over several weeks to months, and uh, the only way of diagnosing is by doing an imaging like mri mri is very specific for it because you can do a csf jc virus but you, uh, the facility is not available with us okay so we do not have a lot of fever headache nausea vomiting but you can have a lot of focal neurological deficit and over the years what as a clinician what i have uh, seen 
you have a lot of cerebellar signs, I do not know the, the books doesn't say that it causes mainly cerebellar, but uh, it, uh, most of our patients come with a lot of cerebellar uh, ataxia and tremor and difficulty in uh, walking due to ataxia. Next slide, please. So the diagnosis is made. For us, you don't know that PCR and for you, I'm quite sure you all don't do it either. So the, for us, the uh, diagnosis is usually made on an MRI where it has a non-enhancing lesion. It is the multifocal non-enhancing lesion all over the brain. And in the T2-weighted uh, MRI sequence, it will be very hyper-intense, okay? Uh, Hyper-intensity does not mean that it is a contrast enhancing, okay? Non-enhancing means if you give a contrast, it does not enhance, okay? So it is a non-enhancing cerebral white matter lesion because the oligodendrocytes and myelinations in the white matter and it is hyper-intensing T2-weighted images. So let's go to the next slide and you can just see the MRI. Yeah. So you can see a lot of hyper-intensive visions um, uh, in, in part of the frontal as well as parietal lobes. So it is quite, when there's a no demarcation, um, so there's multifocal. And in fact, it is also on the other side also, you can see some on the frontal regions. So next slide, please. And it can be easily your... Um, uh, radiologist can easily make that diagnose for you. Of course, you'll send a patient with a typical clinical uh, pattern with focal neurologic uh, deficits and cerebellar ataxia and difficulty in walking. Uh, and then you get this imaging that is very, very diagnostic of EM. Okay. So the management, there's nothing, there's no effective antiviral treatment. So if the patient has newly come with uh, a newly diagnosed PLHIV, he has come with the uh, PML, the most important thing is to give ART as soon as possible and don't wait for anything so that the immune system is good and controls the disease by itself. At times, uh, the patient can have iris, just like as we told about uh, in cryptovocal meningitis. So you started a patient on PML on ART and then the patients uh, started deteriorating and the lesions started increasing. Then that is an indication for giving steroids. Okay. The iris is a definitive indication for giving life threatening iris is a definitive indication for giving steroids in HIV patients. Okay. So the worst prognosis is associated with high plasma RNA levels, poor virologic response to ART, and presence of lesions in the brain stem. Okay. These are poor prognostic markers where the patient may not improve much. Thank you. the next thing, please. So, this is of uh, uh, radiological findings in HIV-related uh, uh, neuropathologies. So, the main differential diagnosis with, uh, uh, of a patient with PML is usually HIV encephalopathy because it's not a space of open lesion. But HIV encephalopathy will not have this T2 hyperintense lesion. What you'll have is cortical atrophy. So, whenever there is cortical atrophy, what uh, a layman, what the a layman sees on that image is the all the ventricles are dilated and all the now cortex you can see it very very clearly with lots of gaps in between. Okay, so in HIV encephalopathy, it is characterized by cortical atrophy, and you may you may or may not have bilateral basal ganglion uh, calcifications. Now in CNS toxoplasmosis, very characteristic same is multiple ring enhancing lesions. That means the uh, when you give a contrast, the contrast lies over the, um, the lesion, the space occupied lesion, and that appears as a ring. So you'll have a multiple ring enhancing lesion with mass effect. And uh, uh, with tubocloma, the single there may be a single ring enhancing lesion with basal meningitis, with hydrocephalus. Okay, and of course you can get a CSF diagnosis by doing a CBNAT. Okay. So um, at times we have a problem with tubercloma and toxoplasma. If there's a single ring enhancing lesion, then we are not sure whether it is tubercloma or toxoplasmosis. And then you can go for CBNAT and look for other places for tuberculosis and you should do an IgG for toxoplasma, not IgM, but IgG for toxoplasma. 
that will help if that is positive you can just give an empirical treatment for toxic plasmosis and the patient usually improves between six to eight weeks and the image also the uh, ct findings also or mri findings also improve by eight, uh, six to eight weeks now pml again i've told you we will just revise it it is multiple hypodensation it is not enhancing to the hypodensation in cortical white white matter it's a white matter lesion hypodensation without any contrast enhancement but if you do an uh, t2 sequence in mri that will be very very hyper intense okay so this is how this is again a very nice table so you can take the csf table i like this 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 is also a very nice table you can remember this next slide please So, what is HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders? Next. Or HAND. Okay. Now, uh, neurocognitive disorders in HIV can be asymptomatic, where there is a subclinical decline in uh, cognition. But we, we can, uh, the patient does not complain anything, but if you do a test, maybe that may show some abnormality. Then it could be minor neurocognitive disorder where there is some decline in cognition, which is mild, and, and uh, they may be a very, very mild everyday functioning impairment and, uh, and affects the more difficult activities of daily living. And uh, the full blow disease is HIV associated dementia, which where there is significant decline in cognition along with significant degree of functional impairment because it is a subcortical dementia. So you will have a lot of functional impairment like walking, talking, that, that impairment is also there. That affects the routine activities, okay? So it, the diagnosis is made in PLHI with cognitive impairment after ruling out other lesions or other confounding conditions. There may be some causes of reversible dementia like vitamin B12 deficiency, hypothyroidism, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to rule them out before you label it as HIV associated dementia. Next slide, please. So uh, it is more likely if, the, if your CD4 count is less than 200 and this, it is due to HIV per se, it is slowly progressive is cognitive decline along with motor and behavioral changes. And there's no focal or diffuse CNS signs. Means there will not be signs of uh, meningitis and fever, headache, nausea, vomiting, etc. There will be no um, non focal uh, uh, there won't be any focal neurological deficits. But in general, the patient may be having a difficulty in walking, the patient may be having difficulty in talking, and there will be a, a behavioral changes. The patient may slow down and may become aggressive, okay, along with progressive cognitive decline, okay. So, it is a diagnosis of exclusion and imaging can help you in that. So, if you just look at the white, white ventricles and very, very black, black and very well-defined cortex, this is how it looks. So, because of the atrophy of the cortex, the ventricles look dilated. It is not hydrocephalus, okay. In hydrocephalus, all the uh, cortex will be effaced, will be full. And you can see the bones. Uh, wait, where is the arrow? Can you see the arrow? Uh, I hope you can see the arrows. Yeah, you see the skull, which is on the outside. And there's a huge gap of black between the skull and the brain parenchyma, the white portion. So that is due to atrophy. Okay. Now, how, how do you treat it? Nothing. Again, ART and effective ART is the most best treatment available. And there are certain ARV regimens which can be included because some guidelines do not say that your therapy needs to be changed. And the exidobodine, your stavodine, abacavir, nevirapine, uh, lamivudine, ifavirins, and tenofovir, they all penetrate the CSF very well and it's good if these agents are there in your regimen sometimes you know like if uh, sometimes what we what we do but you don't have to do it uh, for your patients sometimes we just do a csf viral load for hiv and uh, many times you'll find that the patient does not have a, a detectable viral load in the serum and it's virologically suppressed but in the csf the viral load may be increased 
and that is a condition where if you give a proper change the regimen that means your current regimen is not working in the csf so if you give agents which are penetrate well which are effective in decreasing the viral load in the csf they may be decreasing which um, cognitive decline also okay so we do it in our center but uh, i don't know how much you can do it in your center whether see whether you can take out csf from patients so if you want you can refer those patients to us so we can do it for your patients too next slide please okay now hiv associated vascular myelopathy now when i started this whole uh, session on a new neurological manifestation of hiv i said very clearly hiv can cause anything in any part of the you know, cns as well as pns okay the peripheral nervous system as well as the central nervous system okay anything so when I, it's a dictum we tell all our residents that if you have any neurological problems please get an hiv done okay maybe we are missing out hiv if you don't do a hiv test in all patients with neurological manifestation so can it affect the spine the answer is yes it can and cause myelopathy yes so answer is yes it can cause myelopathy due to various infections like tb syphilis etc or it can cause myelopathy due to hiv per se next slide please and that that is called hiv vascular myelopathy and uh, why it is called vascular myelopathy because we take a biopsy which is usually not done it is a post-mortem biopsy this vascularization of myelin sheet accumulation of domi macrophages and microglia with related sparing of axons as a pathological manifestation because of this vascularization of the myelin sheet uh, that is why it is called a vascular myelopathy and how does that patient present to you with it presents with slowly progressive uh, lower limb weakness which may be asymmetric at first, then because it is in the spinal cord, it is a myelopathy, there will be increase in tone, spasticity, okay? Because dorsal columns are involved, um, very predominantly involved, there will be loss of vibration and position sense. Because again, the dorsal columns are involved, there may be a toxic gait. And later on, uh, urinary frequency and urgency may, uh, may also be uh, uh, present. And erectile dysfunction may also be present. So you can see there is motor, sensory, as well as bladder involvement. So it is affecting all parts of the form. Okay. This actually resembles vitamin B12 deficiency myelopathy in normal people. Vitamin B12 deficiency can occur in normal people. And this is the similar type of presentation which you see in HIV 2. Okay. Due to vascular myelopathy. Now, how do you diagnose? You have to rule out other infectious cause. So, and you should rule out vitamin B12 deficiency. And uh, you can do an imaging of uh, uh, dorsal, uh, uh, dorsal uh, spinal cord. And you can do an MRI where it will be high signal hyperintense hyper lesions on T2 weighted imaging. And um, in the dorsal, as uh, and mainly affects the posterior column. That's what I told you because, and there's a lot of loss of vibration and position sense and sensory attacks. In, okay. And which do not enhance with contrast. So for, it is actually a diagnosis of exclusion. And again, even when you diagnose it, you do not have any specific treatment. And the main differential diagnosis is you have to rule out TB, many, uh, TB uh, myelopathy and you have to rule, rule out vitamin B12 related myelopathy. Okay. And other than ART, there is no other specific treatment and an effective ART for that matter. Next slide, please. Okay, now primary CNS lymphoma. Um, uh, next slide, please. Primary C uh, lymphoma in general are very, very common in HIV. Okay, but uh, you, and most of them are related to Epstein Barr virus. Okay, it's uh, almost 100% related to Epstein Barr virus in HIV. Okay, um, as compared to non HIV, where it is less associated with Epstein Barr virus. Now, it affects around 2% of PLHIV and it's the second most common mass lesion in um, HIV, but actually it varies. It varies from center to, uh, center to center. For us, a mass lesion, the commonest will be TB followed by Toxo, okay? And primary CNS lymphoma would be maybe third, okay? 
So it is always associated with Epstein-Barr virus, as I told you, and it usually occurs uh, uh, in a CD4 common less than 100. It's an AIDS-defining illness, okay? And the presenting symptoms is usually, um, because it's a space-occupying lesion, you may have a lot of headache, impaired memory, seizures, focal neurological deficit. So a myriad of presentation. There is a space of a lesion that can cause a focal neurologic deficit, that can cause a seizures, plus it may cause headache due to all stretching of all other things. Okay, and um, so uh, for anybody with headache and seizures and focal neurological deficit, the first thing you need to do is an imaging. Okay, because toxoplasma, tuberculoma, cryptococcoma for that matter, they are all your differential diagnosis. Brain abscess, fungal ab uh, brain abscess, as well as bacterial brain abscess. These are all your differentials, okay? So you do an imaging. You should not go for a CSF first. You should go for an imaging. And in HIV, if you have to go for any imaging, it is always better to go for MRI. But if you don't have a, uh, the availability of MRI, then it is best to go for contrast CT. Okay, you just do a serum creatinine. If that is normal, go for contrast CT. A plain CT has very less value in HIV patients with CNS manifestation. So go for contrast CT. You just need a serum creatinine before doing it. Okay. So what does this um, MRI show or uh, CT for that matter show in uh, primary CNS lymphoma? The lesions are periventricular and they are ring enhancing lesions. And uh, there's prominent edema because it's a space of open lesions. And uh, because it needs again a biopsy, but for definitive diagnosis, so uh, which is not available and which people do not do easily. It is available in my center, but I don't think so. My neurosurgeon uh, will do it as uh, in a in our patient. They don't do it very commonly. So uh, because it has its own mor morbidity and mortality. So what we can do is you do a toxoplasma IgG, and if that is positive think about toxoplasmosis and treat for that. And then again, we evaluate after six to eight weeks. If that is negative, then you can think about primary CNS lymphoma. And there's no chemotherapy that really, really works well for this disease. So it is not a good thing to have. Okay, next. So we've done the brain, we've done the uh, cord, uh, and now we are into the peripheral nerves, okay? So HIV-associated neuropathies. Next slide, please. So HIV, uh, it's very, very common. Um, those who have worked uh, with HIV uh, in the era of 2005 to 2012, uh, 14, where we gave a lot of zero body in 12, I think. We changed our regimen in 2012, if I remember right. So we gave a lot of zero body in based regimens. There, we saw a lot and lots of peripheral neuropathy and lipoatrophy. It was the most commonest. We could identify patients from one, um, 500 meters. Okay, this must be pill HIV on stamina. And peripheral neuropathies used to be very, very common. But even HIV, per se can cause neuropathies, okay? But the most common cause at that time was drug induced and the most uh, important culprit was stavudine because we did not use a lot of didanosine and zalcitabin was not there. Didanosine was available in the market, but zalcitabin was not available in the market, okay? So um, they are called the D drugs, D4, D, DDI, okay? So the D drugs caused a lot of peripheral neuropathies. Okay. But uh, uh, HIV can affect different parts in, and different in ways. Okay, per se, HIV can cause distal symmetric polyneuropathy. It can cause mononeuropathy multiplex, meaning multiple cranial nerves are multiple peripheral nerves are involved. Okay, that means you may have a um, um, and uh, um, a foot drop, maybe a uh, um, uh, uh, palsy of the ulnar nerve. Okay, so they have multiple nerves involved at the same time. Okay, so and the commonest cause for us of mononeuropathy, multiplexes, rheumatoid arthritis, vasculitis, as well as diabetes. So HIV can also cause that. It can cause something like 
AIDP, that is acute inflammatory poly, um, demyelinating polyradicular uh, neuropathy, or CIDP, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. So uh, uh, HIV comes in the differential diagnosis of uh, uh, CIDP as well as AIDP. Okay. And it can also cause progressive lumbosacral polyradiculopathy, uh, which I told you when I was introducing this whole uh, lecture today. Uh, this uh, that that is typically caused by cytomegalovirus. It causes lumbosacral polyradiculopathy. It means a, a lot of radicals in the lumbosacral region. That means uh, if lumbosacral uh, radicals and uh, nerves are involved, you will have a lot of weakness because uh, your legs are supplied by uh, L1 to L5, S1, okay, and you are we associated with uh, bladder involvement because your bladder is supplied by S2, 3, 4, okay, so that is very characteristic of CMV, but per se, HIV can cause any of these neuropathies, okay, and but the most common neuropathy is distal symmetrical polyneuropathy, but you need to rule out alcohol because alcohol also can cause a distal symmetrical uh, polyneuropathy just like HIV, you have to rule out uh, neuro, uh, other uh, neurotoxic drugs and of course for us alcohol and diabetes needs to be ruled out okay so how does this distal symmetrical polyneuropathy um, present to you it has a lot of sensory elements so the paresthesia um, uh, in the feet is the most common and then like any neuropathy uh, bilateral symmetrical will come up to the knee and when it involves the knee um, 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 knee a little bit above the knee, then the hands will be involved, like like a um, 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 what is that called? A gloves-like fashion in the hands, and um, it it has a very characteristic pattern. It will come from the feet to the uh, legs to the knee, and when it reaches just above knee, the hands will be involved. Gloves and stockings. Sorry, it's a gloves and stockings pattern. Okay. So, and on examination, what will you find? And that the power, of course, uh, may be less. There may be decreased uh, jerks, especially the ankle jerk. They may be absent or decreased. Posterior column sensations like vibratory sensations and position sense. And there will be increased threshold to temperature and pen, uh, pin prick. That is difficult to make out, okay? They'll have a lot of paresthesia. They will not let you touch on me, okay? So is there any treatment available? The answer is no. But if you if there is diabetes, control the diabetes. If there's alcohol abuse, you stop that alcohol abuse, give the requisite deficient vitamins, okay? And if uh, if somebody is actually using, but nobody uses didanosin and scavitin, you need to stop that drug immediately, okay? Next. Next slide, please. Okay. So they did not tell you about myopathy. So uh, because of uh, uh, HIV can also cause myopathy, um, uh, which it may be a polymyositis like, or uh, it, uh, even zidovudine can cause myopathy. And um, HIV can cause something like uh, polymyositis like presentation or degenerative myopathies also. Okay, and it can also cause drug induced myopathy due to zidovudine. The next topic is neurosyphilis. It is very important because it is treatable. And if you don't treat it, and the late sequelae are really, really bad, and those are not reversible. So you need to have a very high index of syphilis in all HIV patients. Actually, everybody is supposed to do an uh, RPR for all patients who have been diagnosed with HIV and who have ongoing sexual activities, um, uh, high-risk uh, sexual activities, you should repeat it in intervals also. So, what is neurosyphilis and how does it present? The next slide, please. So, uh, neurological uh, involvement in syphilis is actually it can present just like tuberculosis. It can be asymptomatic. Okay, it can cause meningitis just like tubercular meningitis, or it can cause later on it can cause dementia. So it can cause spinal cord lesions like tibis dorsalis. So the syphilis and uh, TB has a lot of uh, similarity. So uh, for neurosyphilis, maybe asymptomatic CNS involvement, but you need to detect it. Why? Because if you treat it, the patient will not become symptomatic and that is the most important. It may be acute syphilitic meningitis, usually occurs in the first two years of infection 
and some cases are diagnosed at the time of the secondary rashes, which you get all in the palms and the soles and everything else. It presents just like any other meningitis, and we have already discussed it before. It can present with headache, meningeal irritation, vomit pain, training now with vomitis, okay? And, um, um, and, and the CSF uh, VDRL will be posit positive in this. There may be meningovascular neurosyphilis, just like tuberculosis, tuberculosis can cause vasculitis, even syphilis can cause vasculitis. It can occur a few months, uh, years after the primary infection. So there may be, um, because it is a vasculitis, it can affect any part of the brain. So you may get extremity weakness. You may have, because this associated meningitis, you can, can get associated headache, vomiting, etc. You can also get psychiatric abnormalities as well as personality changes. And usually as um, uh, the time passes, you can get dementias also, okay? So initially you may get a lot of focal neurological deficit and uh, later on it will be a more progressive disease with a lot of dementias and aggressive and abnormal psychiatric behaviors. Next. Okay, so depending upon how is it presenting, syphilis needs to be ruled out. What is most important, what, uh, what I like to trust for, uh, 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 given um, uh, I would like to trust is you try and diagnose syphilis because it's so easily treatable, okay? And because all spirochetes are very, very delicate organisms and you give any antibiotics that are cephalosporins or penicillins, the immediately syphilis can be um, treated. Okay. So signs and symptoms depends upon what stage of the disease the patient has come to you with, whether they have come with aseptic meningitis or the vasculitic phase uh, with meningitis or the uh, late, uh, late phase where there is a dementia and so, uh, other things. So it depends upon that. Okay. So uh, the signs and symptoms is... Uh, I can't say that everybody will have personality changes or a text. It all, always depends or will have stroke for that matter. It depends upon which stage the patient has come to you. As we've already discussed the CSF findings of syphilis, they, uh, the most, uh, there will be a CSF pleocytosis. The cells will be increased, lymphocytic predominant, mild elevation and protein, normal sugar. But if you do the VDRL, it will be reactive. So you can do VDRL even in the serum as well as CSF, okay? So, and for CSF VDRL, if it is positive, it suggests neurosyphilis, okay? And then you need to treat with benzathine penicillin, 4 million units, IV6 hourly for 10 to 14 days. If the patient is penicillin allergic, you can also give septraxone for 10 to 14 days, okay? Or you can give doxine, but septraxone is better. Then it is very, very important that you follow up the patient of neurosyphilis by doing a CSF. The CSF should normalize by six months, okay? And the symptoms also should improve. But your, mainly your CSF VDRL and CSF uh, WBC count should be normal. If it is not normal, then it is prudent to give another course of treatment, okay? Next. Okay. I think I've finished. Uh, I think I've finished. You've already, uh, you have this in the next session. So now if you have any other questions, you can come, uh, you can write it out in the chat box. I can look into it and try and answer them for you. But three, four things you need to remember. Every HIV, PLHIV will have some neurological manifestation in their course of illness, okay? Neurological uh, manifestation may be in the form of meningitis or focal lesions, or it may be in the form of uh, myelopathy, it may be in the form of neuropathy, okay, or in the form of dementia. So these are the five main manifestations. Of course, we've not, we've not discussed myopathy, but it can also cause myopathy, okay. So all parts of the nervous system are involved in HIV. The involvement may, may be due to HIV per se, like aseptic meningitis, uh, uh, the myelovacular myelopathy, or distal uh, neuropathies. Is, these may be due to HIV per se, or HIV-associated dementia. These are all due to HIV per se, or it may be due to some sort of uh, opportunistic infection. 
like cryptocurrency like this talks of plasmosis and then your um, pml or jc virus okay some have treatment like crypto and uh, proxo some do not have treatment like pml so um, where, where you need to uh, give a very very effective prd okay so it is very important and nowadays it has become easier for everybody to diagnose these neurological manifestation and go ahead and treat the opportunistic infection and give a very robust ART in those who are not improving uh, uh, with HIV associated neurological disease. Okay, so that's my summary of those whole two sessions I had. So if you have any questions, let me see the chat box. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, no questions so far in the chat box. Participants can unmute their mic or put their questions in the chat box. Ma'am, I don't think there are any questions. I have. I can give you some time. 250. Yeah, so you can give them five minutes if you want. Oh, uh, any questions? Participants are requested to please put their questions in the chat box. They can also unmute their mic and ask questions. So can I ask one question? Like, how many of you have diagnosed cryptococcal meningitis in your center? Not the medical colleges. I think they should be able to do that. Achha, how many have cryptococcal antigen tests in their centers, in their medical colleges for that matter? So there are 52 participants from different, different regions. So can somebody tell me now? I know uh, KGMC has it. I don't know about Prayagraj, Alaba, the, uh, do you all have cryptococcal uh, crack testing? The RT Center Prayagraj? What about Saharanpur, Saifai? None. Or then everybody is logged in and gone up to sleep. <laughs> Not available in Sultanpur. Yeah, that I know. Okay, Loknak Hospital. Delhi too will have it. No problems. All medical colleges should have it actually. That is what what I wanted to stress. Uh, at least the medical colleges, it's not a very costly kit, you know, like it costs uh, around 500 if the patient pays for it. Uh, UPSAX uh, donated some money, so we bought some kits in our center. And because it's, because most of our patients come from a rural background, I think we need to see, even Delhi has a very high prevalence, it has a prevalence of around 10 10 percent okay so because most of your patients are from uttar pradesh rural background uh, rural backgrounds in uttar pradesh and bihar so we need to do it in all patients um, um with cd4 less than 200 and um, in fact i'm going to ask you to sex to do it the other centers i don't think so anybody has any questions everything is clear there should I stop? Um, Thank yeah, you so Dr. much, ma'am. You can always ask for uh, this crack testing and your lab technician can do it. You have a lab technician, Priti. You can ask that patient because if I am getting environments, you will also get environments. If you, okay. So before the patient, why it is important? Because you can detect this disease before the patient has meningitis. Okay. So, uh, Early treatment can be given, meningitis can be prevented, and mortality can be decreased many, many folds. So, Priti, you should really go for it. Okay. So, thank you, everyone. So, I'll log out now. Yeah, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I'll just quickly run the feedback poll, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. The feedback poll is now visible on your screen. All the participants are requested to uh, attempt all the four questions.
We're requesting all the participants to please attempt the feedback poll. Thank you, ma'am, for facilitating this session. And thank you to all the participants for patient listening. Our next session will be held tomorrow at, from 2 to 3 p.m. And the topic is palliative care for adults and children with HIV. You can refer to chapter number 5.7 of the National Guidelines for HIV Care and Treatment. Thank you, everyone. We'll conclude this session now.